I had finished graduate school and I, I had, uh, one of my partners was a guy named uh, Martin Sweeney who was here trading. And I was enamored with futures and options. I, I thought it was just one of the best ways to invest. And, and uh, there's only a couple places you go. You go to London, you can go to New York, you go to Chicago. I'd been to London, I'd been to New York, and I didn't like either one of them as much as I liked Chicago. So my friend was here and he said, look, I don't know what you think of Chicago, the weekend you spent here, but you know, you should go down to the trading floor. I think this is really up your alley. And they have these visitor galleries that you can observe the opening and you can observe the trading floor. Well, the first trading floor I came to was the Board of Trade here. And the opening bell went off and I got goose pimples. I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. I got to figure out a way to do this. Next day, I went and watched the CBOE open, and I watched all this flurry of activity. And I was like, man, i got to make myself a part of this. And then I went to the CME, and I observed the, the big S&P pit, and all the different colors, and all the different people, and all the different activity, and quite frankly, just the action. I was like, whoa, i got to give this a shot. So I started walking around and hanging around the CBOE and, and looking for a job, and I was told to go and see this nice gentleman by the name of Mike Juniman at Timber Hill. And I went and saw Mike and we hit it off really well. He introduced me to a guy named David Downey who's now at the One Chicago. And uh, I said, look, I, I really wanna try this. I think I could do well at it. And uh, I'm told that you guys might have some opportunities. Well, a couple days go by, Mike Juniman calls me on the phone. And he says, hey, look, are you still willing to come out here? I said, yeah. Uh, he goes, well, I'll have a job for you. I said, great. Uh, what is it? He goes, well, everybody here has to start off as a trade checker. <laughs> I was like, okay. I said, well, what's the process? He goes, you become a trade checker. And then if, you're, if you pass our training program, we'll put you in and take you, take you to have you take the CBOE options test. And then if you earn your badge, we'll put you in a trading pit. I was like, ah, I can do this, you know. So lo and behold, I really didn't know what I was getting into. So I, I start... I start coming down and Mike says, when do you want to start? I said, I can start Monday. <laughs> he goes, no, 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 we'll give you a little more time than that because I had just gra finished graduate school. I came to Chicago with a Marine Corps sea bag over my shoulder and a cardboard box on the other hand getting off at the train station over here and walking out and looking at all the buildings and going, man, I can do this. This is, this is going to be it for me, right? So I show up for work on Monday morning, go me through the training program get hazed a little bit by everybody on the floor and the pits where I was clerking. And then it came to my turn to be a trade checker. And I don't know if anybody remembers that process. You had to show up for work at five o'clock in the morning. And then you get into work and it's my first winter in Chicago. And I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and we saw winter, but the winters in Chicago were cold, right? So I go through my first week, guys training me and all, et cetera. And then the next week I have to do it myself. Well, by now it's, it's below zero out, the wind's howling, standing on that train platform. It was miserable. And I get into the office and you got to pull up the screen. It's the OCC screen for out trades and it's this green screen, right? By the end of the week, I'm frustrated. I'm like, I let loose the string of expletives at the screen. And all of a sudden I hear this voice out of the back. And I said, Donnie Roberts, there's no swearing in my office. What are you swearing about? I said, it was David Downey. I said, David, there is something wrong with this, that you could have this many out trades in this day and age. And he goes, I agree with you. We want to do something about it. Why do you think our, our, our traders are carrying handhelds? So the price goes directly into the system instead of taking all these trade tickets and punching them into the system. And I said, all right. So... After that, you'd walk down to the floor with these sheets, and then you'd have to hunt somebody down and match up the trades and the prices. And it was just a, a intensive process or, or, or extensive process to get something done. And I didn't like that. And I figured there was always a better way to do this, right? 
And then I, I graduated from, took the test, got my, got in the trading floor and look, I getting to work at 745 and leaving at 302 was one of the greatest jobs on the planet. I was like, this is great stuff, you know? And, but I knew that, you know, I started seeing that that trading was terrific. Like you moved to the different trading pitch. You got to meet all these different people. Everywhere you went, you got hazed a little bit. But as long as you were there to trade and you stood up for your markets, everybody in the tree, the pit would start treating you with a little, some, some degree of respect, right? But you had to stand up for your markets, period. If you said something, whether if you were wrong or not, you had to have it done and you had to get the trade done. And then gradually, once they figured out you knew what you were doing, then it became more of a, a fraternity, kind of like going into a local bar. And... You know, you walk into a local bar and there's 15 guys sitting at the bar and nobody wants to talk to you at first, but gradually you get into that, that mood. Buy a couple people a couple of drinks and then you start becoming part of the group. And, and then uh, you move to a different pit and you'd be going to another local bar and you'd have to meet these guys and you'd have to get your ins there and you'd have to show that you would stand up to your markets. And once that happened, you started feeling more and more comfortable with it. And I remember getting on the 156 LaSalle every day after in the morning coming down to work and looking up at the series through the bus window and thinking, man, please let me have no out trades, no calls versus puts, no puts versus calls because that's the worst, right? And every day I would do that. It was like a, a, a thing with me. And then I would get off, go in, make sure I had no out trades, fix anything that I had to, and then I'd go to my pit. And I just really enjoyed doing that with everybody, and I thought it was great. One of the first things I learned is standing in the trading pit with a pair of dress shoes was not the way to do things, because back then you had to wear a shirt and tie, right? And standing in there, I had this pair of dress shoes that I was so proud of, but I realized after the first three days that it wasn't going to cut it. My, I was a young man, and my back hurt and everything else. I like felt like an old, right? So I started looking at everybody's shoes that they had on. And I saw a couple guys with the old referee basketball shoes on. And I was like, oh yeah, that's the idea, right? And so I went out and got myself a, a pair of referee shoes, really comfortable shoes to be on the floor so I could stand the whole time. Nobody was gonna give me any spot to lean on, any railings or anything. So I was standing in the back rows straight as a ladder for I don't know how long. Every day I went to work, I tried to be affable, you know? Always listen, talk to the guys, but while I was talking to them, I'd always listen to all their trades, right? So I would knew, essentially, in my mind anyways, where they were, right? And what they needed and, and how I could not take advantage of it, but yes, take advantage of it, right? Uh, and, and just try and be a good partner in the pit, stick up to my markets and be a, a guy that was known as a stand-up guy. That's what I wanted. I wanted to be affable and be a stand-up guy for everybody. Telemex and Telebras. I go into this trading pit, and it'll go back to my referee shoes. Um, Telemex and Telebras are going to, very similar to the breakup of AT&T. Uh, was going to happen with Telemex and Telebras. And, you know, we all knew it was coming. Everybody's jockeying for position, getting ready for the trades. But all of a sudden, the announcement comes out. And I'm telling you. I had never, I just got goose pimples thinking about it. The opening bell from that moment, from the time that opening bell, the brokers were lined up behind the pit. And I was like, oh, all right, game on. This is going to be a busy day. It was like Tenon Bar and St. Patrick's Day but with a whole bunch, a whole bunch, a lot more money, right? Uh, and I remember when that bell went off at the end of the day, mentally exhausted. And I'm go, I walk outside of the SIBO and I went like this. I looked up and I was like, yes. I go, I did it, right? And I lean up against the building and this, just close my eyes for a minute. This girl walks by who was one of the clerks on the floor. She goes, Donnie, are you okay? I just looked at her and smiled and winked and I said, I'll buy you a beer in about an hour over a cactus. I go, it was a great day. And I go back to the office and I didn't realize it. And I had a pair of brown shoes on, or a pair of my referee shoes, black shoes, and a pair of light tan socks and a pair of brown pants. And I went like this. And I looked down, and the shoes I bought were cheap. <laughs> so I had sweated in them, and there was a line of sweat from the dye on the shoe uh, on my socks. 
<laughs> and I was like, I'm gonna keep these for the rest of my life. <laughs> little after nine, it was actually expiration and everybody's trying to maintain themselves as Delta neutral and just trying to get through the day. Well, of course, I, I have to have a 30 lot out trade calls versus puts. And then I continued to build off of that trade and now all the, the market makers think, and I'm thinking that I made the right trade and I did not. And so it kind of, it kind of ballooned after that. And then at about two o'clock in the afternoon, I realized that I had made a, a couple of boo-boos, right? So I was scrambling to try and fix them before the bell, and I couldn't do it, right? And I did my best, but I, I still had, I still had tripped over my, my tongue and my feet so much earlier in the day that it was just so hard to try and get back to even, and I just couldn't do it, and I just had to go on face the music. But I was okay with that, right? Uh, if, if it was easy, everybody would do it, and it wasn't easy. You could bet on anything in the world on the trading floor, right? Um, what time the sun came up, uh, if somebody could drink a gallon of milk within an hour, how many cheeseburgers somebody could eat. Uh, uh, there was some of that nonsense that went on, uh, but a lot of it involved sports, uh, talking about sports. Everybody used to love when the NCAA tournament came because I mean, they were making markets on basketball games as much as they were in the trading pit. And, and that was great stuff. And that developed a great camaraderie. Mike Juniman, uh, I will admire him for the rest of my life. Uh, I love the way he would take his time to talk to me about my trading day. I would love to hear him banter back and forth about options and, and just have these long discussions over some beers at the OTB parlor over here on Jackson. And... and you know, just enjoyed those conversations and how he would like tell me that the world's going to change a little bit here. And, you know, you, you should probably think to, to get to catch that wave. And, you know, and then, of course, Tom Sosnoff and Scott Sheridan. Uh, I remember being in the in the uh, CBOE and pitching electronic trading and to the different trading firms and and eventually having a conversation with Tom because he wanted to start Thinkorswim, and I truly admired it. And I saw how Thomas Petterfree ran interactive brokers, and I saw how Tom Sosnoff wanted to run Thinkorswim, and then I experienced it with Tom. And these guys, just these different styles of leadership, uh, have really helped me to get to where I am today. I could feel it coming at the CBOE, because I had spoken to a guy named had Watson or something. He worked on the technology board at the CBOE. And I knew that they were a little bit more advanced than, say, the Merck, right? So I spent some time at the Merck, and I, I was a clerk for a guy in the big pit in the S&P 500. And I saw these guys <laughs> making trades, and they'd have to screen their trades up to the pulpit. And the guy would then enter the system, and then they'd record the trade. And I was like, this is silly. And, and I looked up to the left and I saw all these guys in this like grandstand. And these guys were trading on Globex when Globex first came out. And I was like, uh, this or this? This is going, this is what's gonna happen. And I, I started sitting up in the grandstand instead of trying to punch trades into, <laughs> into a handheld unit in the S&P 500. I saw these orders coming into the system and automatically executed instead of somebody raising their hand and, and making sure their prices were on the board and somebody filling out trade tickets properly. All these orders were just going into the system and there were no out trades. I was like, whoa, this is pretty interesting stuff. So uh, I was playing in the Chicago Traders Basketball League. We played on Fridays. This is how long ago. <laughs> and, and I had gotten in a conversation with a guy named Mike Juniman about what I thought some of the inefficiencies were and how they could probably do things better. One was not adding and subtracting fractions faster than the guy next to you. It was the decimal system. And he said, oh yeah, that's coming. And then I was like, you know, with the computer, DL, DLJ Direct, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, Donald, Donaldson, Lufkin, uh, and Generet, um, they started an electronic brokerage firm where people could get online and route orders. 
I was like, man, if they can do it, all these guys should be able to do it. And he goes, well, you know what? I, I think it's going to go that way. And there's a company called we're starting called Interactive Brokers that is going to route and connect people to all the exchanges and, and provide that availability. I was like, well, how do you get in on that? He goes, well, be careful what you wish for because your name's been bannered about. And I was like, okay. Well, I, I tell you what, Mike, I, I would really do it. I, I really want to learn what this means and, and how it works. All of a sudden, I get a tap on, a shoulder, on my shoulder, and it's David Downey, and he ran the exchanges here in Chicago. And he goes, Downey Roberts, I want to talk to you. So I come out of the pit, and he talks to me. He goes, you know, this interactive brokers, we think it's going to be a big deal someday, and we'd like to see if you have any interest. And I was like, oh, yeah, I got a lot of interest in that. And then uh, I went back to the office after work, and I, we, he told me what they did and how they routed orders around the world to all these different exchanges and how it'll be, this is going to change the world. And I was like, well, I'd like to see how the world is going to change, right? And I want to be part of it. And so they offered me a job, and that's how I pivoted. And uh, still to that day, uh, David still made me go and work at all the different exchanges to see how they worked and how they routed trades electronically and how you get people connected to, to the different exchanges electronically and what happens when the order gets to the exchange. And I was like totally fascinated by it. And that's what made me realize that the world is going to move in this direction and there's nothing that's going to stop it. People can slow it down, but they're not going to stop it. And it's just the way it kind of played out. Going to knock on doors, Spencer, was not an easy task. Uh, I used to pull up the, the directories for the different exchanges and their memberships and trying to find out what they were located and try to get in to see them. Uh, and it wasn't easy, right? Because they all had their trading groups. Not everybody had a trading desk. Uh, they, the forward thinkers had a trading desk that routed orders electronically, but a lot of guys were, were reticent uh, to make that move. So I remember being at trade shows and we would get these flyers for interactive brokers and we would hand them out, right? Well, uh, I used to take those flyers and go stand at the train station and stand out in front and hand out flyers to anybody who would take one from me. It didn't matter, it didn't matter who it was. I was giving them to guys that were accountants for, for the city of Chicago, for Christ's sake. But I, every once in a while, I would land someone there was actually either a floor trader, was a clerk, or, you know, on, on occasion, I would get someone higher up on the food chain, and then I would get intros into these offices. And then I would go and demonstrate our trading system. The trading systems that I, I was selling used to be able to show all four options exchanges in the bids and offers, right? And there was a, a thing called raise bandits back then, because guys used to be able to sit at home and kind of have that same advantage that the market makers had who had traders on the different exchanges, right? So essentially they, they would be talked about as picking people off, picking market makers off at the exchange. And the attitude that some of the guys that I thought were my friends had towards me uh, afterwards. And I remember I would purposely avoid getting on the elevator at the CBOE between three o'clock and 3.30 because they didn't want to see some of these market makers because they knew I was selling these electronic trading platforms that they thought were these raised bandits picking them off, right? I used to take a lot of harassment, needling, and, and some guys were downright pissed off at me. And that's when it dawned on me uh, that, well, we're ushering in a different way of doing this. And there will be obstacles and people will be mad, but it's just going to be for a period of time. And then the world will see a lot of the advantages that came with the electronic trading. And I would just stay off the elevator till 3.30. You're essentially maybe moving some of their jobs. You're taking money in their eyes out of their, out of their, their family and uh, how they feed their family and how well they live. But I was also, that taught me that you've got to move on. The world evolves and this is evolving. And that's the way I've thought about uh, the financial industry ever since.